at the DGP. And now that I think about it, because this used to be the lounge facing this way, I'm pretty sure my desk was on exactly the other side of that wall. So lots of good memories, lots of uh, tough times too here, but I mean, I survived and I'm having a lot of fun now for sure. So today I'm talking about uh, input devices. So one of the input devices that um, we're all very familiar with is the mouse. And this is the original Macintosh mouse. We all know the story that Apple didn't invent the mouse, but they certainly popularized it. And this enabled people to use uh, the graphical user interface, which we all use today, and it's been super successful. Um, when they first introduced the mouse, what's interesting is that people didn't know how to use this thing. So they had to have actually a tutorial. This is the original tutorial to show them how you can point, how you can even do this thing called clutching, where you lift up the mouse to reposition it. And they also, they also explained what the different uh, the different types of things you could do with the mouse were. So for instance, just pointing at things, moving around and placing over top of a target, or clicking on things. I mean, these are all new concepts that people that prior to this used computers just with very prominently with a keyboard only, as well as things like dragging and even double clicking as well, which we'll see in a second. So people followed this tutorial, got to know how the mouse worked, and then they were able to get on with their work. And this is an important part both for learning what the mouse is, but also learning something called an input space, or the space of actions I can do with the mouse. So we have this uh, input device, this simple mouse with one button, and it creates uh, certain types of actions. You can move the mouse, you can click on the button, you can hold down the button, you can just click it, or you can even double click it. And when we combine these, this set of actions, we can think of it, the input space is really being not just what the mouse can do, but the intersection with what human capabilities are. And we have many, you know, obviously it's very easy to move our hand and to point at things, and we're just doing these things through the mouse and using this vocabulary that the mouse creates to do our different actions. But it's somewhat limited. It's a fairly small input space compared to what we can do with our hands, right? We have five fingers, we have a lot of degrees of freedom, and people were thinking, well, maybe there's more to this. So those of you familiar with the magic mouse, it's expanded this input space. So now we can use other things like the location of touch, swipes on the mouse, um, swipes in different directions as well, up and down versus left and right, and even things like two finger touches or two finger contacts. So the input space, it's still a mouse. It still has the basic characteristics of that original mouse, but now the input space is being increased. And you could argue that this is getting closer, or at least we're trying to get a little bit, um, harness a bit more of the capabilities of what we can do with our hands, right? We can do a lot more than just um, click on a single button. And the hope is that by increasing this input space, we're making people even more productive in some way. So people can get more things done more quickly if you can uh, communicate your intentions to the computer more efficiently. Um, And of course, um, I mean, no one uses a mouse anymore. Well, of course they do, but it's even another more popular input device are tablets and multi-touch devices. And here, the input space is quite big, and it's exploiting you know, closer to maybe what those human capabilities are in the number of contacts using your fingers in different ways. So again, the, this input space is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, maybe getting closer to what human capabilities are. But I would argue that we still have a really long way to go if we want to get an instrument or an input device that really pushes and, and, and embraces the different capabilities we have as humans. So the violin, which of course is not a computer input device, but is something that is, um, really pushes the boundaries of what you can do and really utilizes all those different degrees of freedom, um, not just of one hand, but of both hands and different kinds of movements and different kinds of planning and so forth. So the mouse input certainly pales in comparison to what you can do how you can express yourself on a violin. So you think about the violin space here, there are all these different dimensions of input that the violin allows with different types of how you hold the strings, how you use the bow, and you create this really complex input space which allows you to be very um, expressive. So you can play a violin in different ways to communicate through music, and my argument is that this would be the kind of achievement that we want with computer input devices as well. We want to be able to actually really express ourselves and use the full capabilities of our, of our bodies and our minds as well. 
And I guess the, uh, the related to this is what is the mouse? Well, essentially, it's kind of like a triangle, right? I mean, essentially, we're using something very simple that you can ding the triangle, and you can ding it at different times, but that's about as much as we could do. I mean, there's a little bit more to this, but we're kind of still in this triangle phase. Now, a triangle is much easier to play, right? Anyone can pick up a triangle, and if you can read music even a little bit, or at least count in your head, you can, you can play it. Of course, a violin takes some ability and expertise, but you get a lot out of it by investing this time. And we use computers a lot more than you know, even professional uh, violin players probably play the violin, right? So investing some time in learning new and more complex input devices isn't really such, isn't as far-fetched as you may think. Uh, so we can graph these different kinds of uh, instruments against input space. And you can see that if I put human capabilities, my argument is that the violin is at least starting to approach <coughs> our capabilities. But if you look at a similar graph for input devices, we've got quite a gap, right? So even multi-touch, which is much more expressive than even the magic mouse, we still have this expressivity gap. There's a gap between what the device can do and what the human is capable of in terms of, and I'm making the argument at this point primarily about physical movements, so the physical articulation of your fingers. So a lot of my research, and the research I'm gonna talk about today is how do we make input more expressive? How can we increase this or decrease this expressivity gap and let us express ourselves you know, more fully when we're using computer devices? And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, a couple different projects that sort of capture this idea. Some I'm going to go into more detail. Others I'm going to go over a little bit lighter. But I think it should give sort of an idea of at least what my hope is with this body of work. So the first project is a, a project working in touch input, multi-touch input. And I want you to think about the kind of tasks you do typically with a gallery application. So you have a bunch of thumbnails, and you have to maybe reorder them, or edit them, or select them and share them. There's different activities you have to do with these. And one of the challenges in this kind of interface is you need to distinguish different kinds of touch. This is where multi-touch is great. I can use one finger or two finger or so on. But even that only goes so far. So here's a classic case. If I want to do some action to uh, a photograph a thumbnail. Typically, I have to use this thing called a long touch or a dwell. So to distinguish between maybe dragging it and moving it around, I need to hold down for a while, wait. And then even worse, there's a menu up at the top that I have to select. This is, this is how Android works with the standard um, Android photo application. So it's slow, and it moves me away from the object of interest. So this is, this is a classic thing about not having a very expressive type of interface. And if you look at that multi-touch input space again, one of the interesting things is that although there's a lot there, there's a lot of these different circles, these different possible actions, usually there's a couple little cracks. So if you look closely, there's a little tiny hole there. And inside, this project is about this small little bit of increasing input space called the pin and cross, which I'll explain in a second. And it's a way to increase this input space and address this very problem I just showed you earlier. And the whole hinge of this is that we can distinguish two types of touches or two types of selection, target selection. So we have the one everyone is used to, which is tapping. So I can tap on targets, of course. Um, but I can also cross through targets. So if I have a, a line, I can cross through. In fact, I can even cross through in two different directions. And it's an alternative way to select targets. Now, this is there's work going back, I guess, 20 years now that really looked at this idea of crossing through targets with pen computing at the time. But it's an idea that's still there, and there's been a couple projects, but it hasn't really been looked at in great detail. And one of the exciting things, and we actually have a, a paper that we published that actually looked at crossing on touch input, um, touch devices in, in a lot of detail. And out of that project came this idea, well, why can't we combine both of them? Why can't we combine touching and crossing together? So the idea is that one finger pins something, and the other finger crosses nearby. And with this kind of gesture, I can now do actions that are, number one, distinct from all other current multi-touch actions. When you think about it, you never do this on, a, on an iPad or, a, or an Android device. And we can exploit this unique kind of input space and then enter some commands. And here's the technique. So I click on one of those thumbnails. I get a little menu. And now by crossing one of the radial targets nearby, I can do different actions like, in this case, 
rotating 9 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise, which has a very natural affordance as well. And I can still drag the, drag the there's no confusion with dragging because it's about a static pin in a nearby cross. And once I get good at this, I can actually do things quite quickly. So here I'm, after doing some sorting, you can access these commands. Once you know the rough location of where that menu is, you can access it very quickly and do these different kinds of actions like that. Um, one question that people always ask is, well, what do I do about things on the corner? Well, we can do this, where I can, I can drag it out and begin a drag, but then stop the drag halfway through and then execute one of these pin and cross actions. And now it knows that, oh, you didn't mean to drag and reorder the thumbnail. You meant to get it out of the way and access this menu. So even this is a part of the input space that, that fits in and doesn't actually overlap with the, uh, with the traditional space. So that's, I'm going to show some other demos because it goes even, you know, and, and I got more. There's even more ways you can use pin and cross, but this is a general introduction to how it works. And now in this project, I'm just going to show a little bit of detail about how we explore this input space because there's a bit of science here too. It's not just uh, interaction design, although that's, that's a lot of fun. So we did run a, a study. I'm even, I'm even just warnings. I'm going to show you a graph in a moment, so just but don't worry. No p-values. So we ran an experiment, and we wanted to understand, well, what is the range of motion in this kind of radial target crossing input space? And we um, had a bunch of people, and we looked at four task variations that I'll explain in a second. And in each of these task variations, we had people select the targets um, in these different uh, radial positions, 360 degrees around a central target. Here are the three different conditions we tested. So the first one was exactly what I just showed earlier. So there's a single target, a single finger pin. I pin the target, and then I cross these different radial targets that show up, and they're randomly um, ordered. So I have to use uh, different fingers, different strategies, and this was all interesting to us. We didn't say which finger to pin. We just said just pin it. So a variation of this are two finger pins, and I'll show some interaction techniques in a moment that exploit this idea of having two finger pins as well. And, and then another variation is, well, now here's a one-finger pin, but it occurs after a drag. So similar to what I just showed you with the edge, but there's even other ideas for that. So we wanted to see if maybe after a drag, it changes some of these dynamics, and maybe I can't access some targets as easily. And then, of course, two fingers um, after a drag as well. So these are the four different conditions that people did this um, activity. And what did we do? We measured how fast they did it, how many errors, and then we asked for subjective ratings based on these different angles. It's kind of mesmerizing, isn't it, once you watch that for a while. Um, so here's a graph, and this graph is showing time in, in milliseconds, and based, I've uh, unwrapped that 360 degree radial angle, and you can see the, the compass directions there. And what we looked for is a trend to see, are there positions where the time is you know, kind of making a little bit of a bump or having a bit of a dip. Lower time is better. And we're just looking at some kind of trend. And you can see some pretty clear trends, especially with some of those conditions. And the error bars are showing uh, 90, yeah, 95 uh, confidence, 95th percentile confidence intervals. Um, related to time, uh, time is only part of the story. Another part, of course, are errors. So when did they miss the target or maybe um, select a different target or just make some extra touch. And here you see a similar trend where higher error is bad, we want error to be low, and the dashed line is 5%, which is usually a nice magic number. If you can get errors under 5%, things are okay. Um, the, probably the most important one, as a lot of us know when we're actually doing these kind of studies, are what do people think, right? Like what is their subjective rating of comfort or ease of use? And here's a chart, and I've inverted it, so five is actually better, so the low parts are high preference and high parts are low preference. And what we do is we look at the valleys of each of these three measures, and then we can make a, a real recommendation on which of these angles are actually useful, or which of these angles are preferred, have low time, and reasonable error. And we can make recommendations based on that. So we let's change the visualization, and we can, we, from this data, suggest these are the ranges of angles that are the best candidates to put these pin and cross uh, radial targets. So for one pin or for two pin, make these nice little butterfly kind of pictures. Um, that uh, was before, or was a static one. Here the dark blue is after a drag. The range changes a little bit. And we can also look at the predominant direction, which is no surprise, but it's good to verify it by data as well. And the, the predominant direction is actually very important because 
each of these radio targets can be selected in both ways, clockwise or counterclockwise. So I can put my most frequent, frequently accessed command in the, in the predominant direction and then my less frequently command in the other direction. So clockwise movements, for example, on the right would make sense. Now these are all done, I should qualify that these are all done with right-handed participants and we haven't done, we haven't looked at whether it exactly mirrors, but there's some expectation there would be some, some symmetry going on if you had a, if you're using your left hand. Um, another thing I won't go into any detail at all is that this wasn't only to understand which ones are preferred, but also for us to develop uh, a heuristic uh, recognizer. So basically a way we can look at all this data and we can develop um, a set of rules to recognize which of these gestures are pitting cross and which aren't, but there's some math involved and things, so. Um, and uh, so here we have, we know which angles to do, which are the best ones. We also ran a comparison against some other leading techniques. And um, so we had pin and cross. So here I'm using a restricted set of these angles and eight different target directions. And the task was, you know, select these different angles. We compared it against a marking menu, which is another classic menu that has this same kind of shortcut um, characteristic. And another menu that's a variation, it's a sort of a half pie menu and another one that could be used. So basically we're looking at how does this pin and cross technique compare against these other, I don't want to say computing techniques, but like alternative ways to do something similar. Now the one thing that is important to note is that for techniques um, like the marking menu and also for the pie menu is that you have this, this tension between dragging and selecting the menu. So with the marking menu, you have to have some kind of initial dwell because I, otherwise I don't know whether do you mean to drag the thumbnail or to make a menu selection. So there's this 500 milliseconds, which is the usual number. You have to pause for half a second and then make your motion, which is still way better than that first Android example I showed, but you have this 500 millisecond cost all the time. So um, we ran a study and we got some good, good results that pin and cross indeed has this benefit. Now I just told you that there was a built-in 500 millisecond delay and if you look closely at the data and let's just, I'll just, there's some other characters we showed, but if I subtract that 500 millisecond delay, let's assume that dragging isn't a problem and there's some other way to support it, which is still kind of a tricky problem. We're still very competitive. So pin and cross, if, if I have to deal with this 500 millisecond delay, it's, it's got an advantage and if I can somehow get rid of that for the other techniques, it's still compare, it's still, com, um, similar. And the great thing is I'll show in a minute, and then in fact it's also, um, it's not a us or them kind of decision. The two can actually work together quite nicely. So I'll show a pin and cross leading into the marking menu in a moment. Great. So I'm going to show some expanded interaction techniques. First, I'll just sort of, just so we remember where we are, here's that context menu again, but I'll show a couple other ones. So first doing rotation, which has this really nice affordance, but that's not the only things we can do. It's using a little thumb uh, cross can do uh, cutting or deleting different photos. Can go into a selection mode using another finger. Notice how sometimes they use, they pin with different fingers and then use a different finger to do the crossing. These are things that are, you know, can be learned like and planned for doing it, a little bit like uh, playing that violin. And I think in a motion, yeah, so here when I do, just give it a moment. Here we go. So here's a share menu, so I go to share, and now I turn pin and cross into a marking menu. So I combine and do it again. So pin and cross to do the sharing mode, and then marking menu to choose whether you want to share to Facebook or Evernote or whatever. So there still is mutual compatibility between the two techniques, which is a nice quality to have when you're designing interaction techniques for um, uh, within to fit within a current um, input space. Great. So Here's an example of a two finger pin used to scroll. So a common challenge in multi-touch is how to scroll efficiently. So page up, page down, jump to the bottom. So here I can use a two finger scroll and then use my third finger to either page up, page down, or, or skip to the end or bottom using the same kind of uh, pin across, which is a really nice, really nice technique. And using uh, rotate scale transform type um, interactions. So one challenge is, well, how do I turn something like angle snapping on? So here, while I'm right in the middle of doing my two finger rotation scale translate, I can use my third finger to toggle something like a 45 degree um, angle snap on and off. 
which is kind of a nice, like you don't have to leave your interaction to turn this mode on, and you can turn it off again as well. And just doing standard direct, direct manipulation like drawing, I can be in the middle of making that action and then change you know, the type of object that I'm drawing, whether it's a sketch drawing or a rectangle or a line, or change the line characteristics, like change how thick the line is, or what transparency it has, or what, what uh, color characteristics it has and things. So yeah, so just adjust that in the alpha. So you can see that I never have to leave the middle of the action, and it has this kind of um, fluidity, or you're sort of in the moment, and you can still make these adjustments, which is a nice quality. So that was pin and cross. I'm, I'm going to go. That was the most detail I'm going to go into. I'm going to sort of go through the other ones a little bit less detail. Um, um, yeah. So the next example I'm going to talk about is something that fits into the pen input space, which I didn't talk about earlier. I mean, you'd really think about using a conventional pen. Um, if I don't have an eraser function, I basically have a nib, and I can touch the nib on the tablet, or I can move it in different ways, quickly, slowly, make circles, whatever it might be. And it creates, you know, it's a pretty good um, input space here, but we're looking at, well, how can we expand this even further? Because pens have the same kind of mode problem that you had with, with touch. So here, just as an example, so I just made this particular mark, this kind of circle, and I could take a poll in the room and I could say, well, what did I mean? What was my intention for this? And you might say, well, I meant to make exactly that mark. So I did, that's all I meant. But you could say, well, what you really meant is I meant draw a circle. So I made this rough gesture. Now beautify it and make it into a perfect circle. Or maybe I meant to write the letter O. And if there were some objects here as well, then you might argue that, well, what you really meant is I was doing uh, lasso selection. I wanted to select a couple of objects. So it's exactly the same motion every time but that motion means different things in each case. So it means either sketching or a circle or a letter or a selection. So there's this notion of um, ambiguity, and the ambiguity is only resolved in like what mode. So in other words, I have to go to a tool, and we do this all the time in tools like Illustrator. I turn on selection or I turn on drawing, but it's a round trip again up to the toolbar, similar to what I saw before. Oh, that's me talking very slowly. Okay, so, so for inspiration, my time in art school, I spent a lot of time in life drawing classes, which is what you have to do, especially in your foundation year. And we use this uh, crayon called a Conte crayon, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And it's the square-sided crayon that, whether you use a corner or different edges, it actually creates different thickness of lines, and it works really well with touch as well. I can tuck it into my finger, and I can smudge it. So we thought, well, can we maybe make a digital version of this and use this to solve that mode switching problem I just showed you? So it's, it's what we did. And ours is it's a little bit bigger. It's an uh, extruded rectangle as opposed to an extruded square. But it has the same characteristic that depending what contact I touch, it'll change, it can change different modes. So if I think of the geometry of this, this uh, digital Conte crayon, there's actually 26 different possible ways that I can touch it to the top of a display. So I can use a corner, I can use the end, a short edge, a side, a long edge, and potentially I could use each one of these to do something different. So if I used, um, I could use the different corners, for example, to do those different types of circles I just showed it earlier. And we built this uh, device, it was a little bit, the, the technology is a bit clumsy, but it was enough for a proof of concept. And one of the ideas is we could make some kind of drawing program. Like people always go like, oh great, it's a new, you know, a digital version of Conte for artists to sketch, right? Which is very natural and that's, you know, one potential application. But we were more interested in using this as a general graphical user interface tool. So basically like a different kind of pen computer. But instead of a pen, now I have this, this square-sided crayon that I can change whether I touch corners and so on. So I'm going to show some examples of how I can use this. So for instance, Here's an example of different drawing modes. So I'm using one corner, and when I draw, it's literally just leaving the ink behind. So if I do this little, in this case, a little roll up, I touch one edge and roll up to a corner, now it knows to use handwriting recognition. So it's a very subtle change. I can switch back to this drawing mode, doing another roll up, and now I can quickly switch between doing rough sketches with a corner and these beautified shapes with one of the short edges, and then use the other short edge to quickly move to selection. 
And if it's hard to tell exactly what I'm doing, that's good because it's actually very subtle and it's very fast, right? Like I just need to switch these little, almost like micro movements and radically change what the device is doing. Um, but, there's, but there's more. So I could also use the ends. They have this sort of stamping-like analogy or metaphor. And I can do things like a copy and paste operation, which is also a bit of a pain in a lot of um, touch computing devices or even pen computing devices. And you can see there how it works nicely with touch. So nearby touches with my finger can change, in this case, what the default action is of this menu. And I'm actually changing going between copy and paste by just twisting 90 degrees. So here I'm going to copy the attribute from one shape, so this orange color, and then by twisting 90 degrees, I'm now pasting the attribute into other shapes. Again, quite subtle, but it's not only the contact, now I'm actually exploiting the contact and the angle as well. Another example is I can set, I can just set it down because it's a square-sided crayon, it actually rests very nicely. When I set it on the, on the surface, it, palettes can come out. Palettes are not bad, it's still useful to have palettes. It's good to not have them stuck at the top all the time. I can even, if I need to use a palette for a while, I can pull it off of the crayon, use it to do some, some drawing afterwards. And once I've completed whatever steps I need to do to use this, these palettes to change the colors or the, or the typeface, I can pick them back up again by just putting Conte down in a position where, where I did before. So I kind of use them when I need them and then get rid of them. So again, it's this similar to pin and cross that was compatible with past techniques. Um, this Conte crayon is still compatible with past or gra conventional graphical user interface techniques as well. Using one of the short edges, um, I can create different kinds of uh, guidelines for drawing, for example. And notice how I'm using, um, again, touch plus Conte together to uh, pin down the guideline. Here I'm going to show how to do alignment. So I select some shapes using one of those short edges, create the guideline. And now by doing swipes or taps, I can either center, left align, or right align just by doing these, these nearby touches on that guideline lift up the crayon and the guidelines gone. So again, something that's actually pretty difficult to do in a lot of pen computing devices. And finally, this is kind of a, you know, why, you know, sometimes you miss the mouse, especially if it's a very large display. So setting it on another side creates this little virtual mouse. So I can either pick really small targets or maybe pick targets that are far away. And then when I'm done with the mouse, I can pick up the Conte and it's no longer a mouse. Now it's back to a pen. And just as, so this was a project that I did after my PhD, it was like the thing that I wanted. My PhD was on none of, none of this, um, but I was excited about this other project and I did it and it was published in 2011. And now I have, an, an, um, Lisa's here today, who's continuing the work and we actually have a, um, the big problem with this old, this old Conte or original Conte is that we needed a, we, all we needed was a $15,000 diffuse illumination uh, old Microsoft Surface, which not everyone has in their living room. So now we're creating, and we'll have created, a capacitive version, I mean, more correctly, Lisa's created it, a capacitive version of Conte. And we're now going through and doing some work on this. And this one can now detect all 26 contacts, where that other version actually only detected a subset. So pretty exciting to actually have something that can really work with conventional devices. It's just a teaser. I'm not going to tell you anything else about that. It's uh, great. So. Another input space that is, you know, maybe it's arguable, like if this is an input device or not, is just a bare hand midair input space. This is becoming very hot with virtual reality and augmented reality. So using your hands, you don't even have an input device, you just use your hands to point or gesture and control a computer. And hopefully this creates an input space that's exact parity, right? So it's, you know, the capabilities in my hand and I can move the hand are exactly equal. But of course there are realistic problems that there's, you have, um, issues with what you can sense from different sensors. There's issues with Midas touch. So you have to sort of limit the input space a little bit. Um, but at a high level, you've got, you can take hand, hand movement and hand pose, and you can have different kinds of you know, point, gesture, select, and so on. So this next project was looking, looking at this. And it has a particular, there's two aspects to it. One is the sensing problem. So rather than using an environment camera that's maybe mounted up on the display, we mounted two leap motions Around the, uh, ar around the thighs. So the idea is that this, now I've got on an, a camera on my body, so it's always there. It doesn't get blocked by other people. I don't have to, you know, like, if I get too far away, it doesn't matter. Um, the really nice thing about this, too, is it also forces, or encourages, slash forces you to do arms down, 
gestures. So the typical way you see these connect demos is people waving their hands madly in front. And you've, I'm sure you've heard about gorilla arm syndrome and things like this, like people get tired. So here you can do all the actions by keeping your hand down. And it becomes pretty subtle too. So I just put the circles to make sure you're watching the fingers. And it's two-handed, so there's a left and a right hand action. And we map different commands to these different actions. Having arms down is not only less fatiguing, but it also works really well with a, with a large touch screen as well. So if you want to use the two things together, I don't have to wave my hand and actually click the display. I can keep one hand down to do certain kinds of actions that maybe are more comfortable to do than reaching up. Because it's tiring reaching up on these large displays as well. Uh, a big part of this project is actually the visualization because I'm not looking at my hand, it's down by the side. We needed a way to communicate what the device saw. So we have this little thing we call hand cursor, which communicates which fingers are up and down and the thumb position. And we use that vocabulary of finger pose and thumb pose especially to do different actions. So here I'm doing a pointing pose and I can get this tracking cursor and then using the thumb, kind of like a you know, child do their guns, to uh, click on targets. And you can see that Oh, and the other nice thing about this is it also communicates when your hand is going out of the range of the sensor. So in fact, we, the leap actually sees a lot more than we use, but we artificially limit that so that when the hand gets close to the range that we want people to stay in for fatigue reasons, we can communicate using this transparency and this off-centeredness to go like, hey, you're, you're losing track and you better put your hand in the middle. So visualization is, is a very important part of making this thing work. We also um, made a consistent vocabulary with touch. So actions you do on touch, like tapping to draw, um, to drop one of map marker, is the same as using um, one finger point. Or two fingers, two finger pose to open up a menu in the gestural mode is the same as two finger tap onto the display. And here, so one finger uh, pan is the same as one finger pan with the gesture motion. And, and zoom is, is a rate controlled zoom in both devices. And then there's also a, a two finger menu on that, on the non-dominant hand as well. So we wanted to get this, it's not an exact parity because of course using a touch display and gestures are two different input devices. You can't get exact parity, but enough that you could, these things don't fight with each other. At least there's some alignment, which makes it a little bit easier to learn and use. Great, so that's, um, and, and of course the project was called Gunslinger for obvious reasons. You know, you kind of have this, in fact, it was maybe one of those projects that started with the name and then the project came out of it. I don't know, I mean, maybe I shouldn't admit that, but there's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, so it's a fun project to do. Uh, but I wanted to also, so I started out talking about the mouse and kind of maybe slagging the keyboard a little bit, like, you know, this was the way, you know, the way forward and being really productive computers. But of course, we still use keyboards too, right? In fact, we use them even on touch displays. And the keyboard space, when you think about it, is you've got lots and lots of keys, but the main actions you can do is you can press a key, or maybe you can also push a modifier key like shift or, or command at the same time. But that's kind of it, right? Like that's about the only actions. And the main uh, input space is, or the main uh, criteria is, or parameter is which key did I press? So if you look at shortcut keys, and we use them all the time, maybe some of us not as much as we should because they're, they're a little bit difficult to learn, you can do these different kinds of actions, but there's no difference between how I actually press the keys, right? All it cares about is the key press. So we want to say, well, what about if I could get rid of those modifier keys and just understand what finger is pushing the key? So here I'm pushing S but I'm using different fingers and even different hand poses. If I could recognize that, I could get something similar to shortcut keys, but in fact, I could get a lot more because we have you know, 10 fingers and so on. So we created a system that um, can recognize hand postures in real time. So pressing the G key with maybe an open hand index finger could mean just G, like typing a G, but doing it with the right hand with different, uh, pressing G could mean like different commands like grab and so on, or pressing with the thumb could be gap. So in other words, in every one of those cases, I'm, I'm pressing G, but depending what hand I press, what finger I press, and what pose, whether I'm using a, an open hand or a closed hand, changes what that command means. So this is total like keyboard on steroids, right? I mean, this is like, you know, this is almost a violin, right? So clearly there's like a, a learning curve here, but there's a potential reward too. You can really communicate at a much higher level or a much more nuanced level or more expressive level. Um, right, so we have this big potential input display, so 20 different postures. 
um, per key press. So we did run a study, and I'll go through this one a little bit, maybe a little bit more quickly, but we ran a study looking at, well, what are the right postures or the right actions to do, right? Or which are the ones that are most comfortable? And we controlled for the kind of key presses that come after using the mouse or using a, a touchpad in this case, or after typing. So we had a, a formal experiment, had them type a little bit, then they had to enter one of these poses, and then type or use the mouse a little bit, enter one of these poses. And we had you know, lots of people do this and measured things again like time, error, and subjective preference. And just like in Pin and Cross, we can create some graphs and look at some of the trends. So here we're looking at time, um, so first of all, I should say like error rate was, was pretty consistent. So people had fairly low error rates, so that really wasn't much of a discriminator. But time, you can see that there's definitely a preference to thumb and index, and there's some time cost for some of the other fingers. But as usual, preference tells the real story. Now here, confusingly, I didn't invert the scale, so here high is actually better, but low time is better. So we're looking for a peak in green and a trough in blue, and I can... And we did the same for uh, open hand and a closed hand. Closed hand is even a more extreme. And you can, when you think about, if you do it yourself right now, you can think about why using your ring finger with a closed hand is a terrible idea. Um, but we can confirm that with data now. And, but we can take these two things together and we can make recommendations and say, well, here are the ones that highlighted in green that you should uh, prefer. So if you want to map most of your commands, you should be using thumb and index finger of closed hand or index finger of open hand. And here are ones you should definitely avoid. So you should avoid, obviously, like I said, ring finger for closed hand. Interestingly, so the middle finger, closed hand, is actually pretty performative. But there was, and I, I won't make the gesture to you right now, but if you think about it, people were really uncomfortable with doing that because they're essentially you know, doing that to themselves all the time. So I mean, it's a funny thing that we didn't really think about, but at least in, in Canada and North America, this has pretty negative connotations, so to be avoided. And then the other ones that are not marked red or green are just are reasonable, but maybe for secondary commands. Um, so this does have a small technical contribution. We had to write like real computer vision code to make this work. Um, a neat idea is we just use the built-in uh, Mac camera, and there's a little, you, maybe you know about this little iPad toy, you can buy this little reflector, so we bought that toy and used their reflector. So it basically aims the camera down, and we cheated a bit and made the keyboard green, although now we have a new system. We got rid of the green keyboard. Uh, chroma key was, is a very handy thing to have when you're doing background subtraction. And then, um, yeah, there's a bunch of, uh, there's an algorithm and some techniques that we can detect these different kinds of hand poses from that. And the really cool thing about it is um, my student that did this work, he actually, it really works. Like, it actually runs as a, as a daemon on OS X, it actually can inject like global uh, key control. So in fact, we can control any app through this. And it runs reasonably fast. There's some lag, but it's, it's, it, it takes your battery down fairly quickly. But. So one example is here we are in real Google Docs. So using, so pressing H can change different heading styles. So I just pressed it with, my, with the index finger for heading one, uh, the middle finger for heading two. These are open, open hands or the the ring finger for heading three. So how many people remember, you know, the shortcut key for heading one, two, and three? Like it's not, um, pretty sure it's option command, at least on a Mac, but you may not remember that. And then thumb also did um, for normal text. Another thing is to look at these mappings, like these typical kind of up and down mappings. So here, pressing S for size with the, the little finger or the index finger makes the text go up, um, up or down. Or likewise, pressing C for contrast with different fingers or O for opacity can make them go up and down as well. So these kind of mappings be, are pretty natural that you can think of a lot of cases where you have different up-down actions. And we also kind of wanted to explore how far could we push this. So here's one where now, if I've already know the pose, well maybe I can track the thumb as well and do some continuous input. And my favorite one is this two-handed interaction because I mean, whoever presses a key with, with the same key with two fingers, so say it's ready to log out, you can push L with two fingers, doesn't happen too often and you get your log, because I can never remember what the, the log out is on a Mac or the sign out for some reason. So the, the input space there is, is quite big and, and kind of interesting, um, and, and we have some data to show which of the actions we should use. So, so the final um, main project I'm gonna talk about is in the smartwatch space, which is another very hot space right now. And when you think about us using a smartwatch, 
there's a pretty limited set of things you can do. So I can, I can touch the, the screen of the watch, or at least with the Apple Watch, I can twist or push the crown, right? So there, that's, that's my vocabulary for the most part. I mean, I'm not talking about this voice as well, right? And then I've got different kinds of movement kinematics. So maybe I can do, there are some you know, gestures and the accelerometer and things, and of course movement kinematics with my finger, like swipes and so on like that. Um, so this is, a, this is a reasonable vocabulary, but we're wondering, well, how can we push this further? So we got some inspiration from a real watch, like a watch watch, not a digital watch. Um, and one that is, I guess, for people that are always traveling between New York and LA or something like that, and they need to keep track of two different time zones. So it's a watch that actually has two different faces. So I can pop it up and see another face, and it, it actually changes the, change, you know, I have two watches in one, but there's this like tangible movement to move between time zones in this case. So we created a, a tangible watch, which also has two screens. So this one, depending on the orientation of the, of the top screen, for example, it can have different commands. I can do these actions like peeking underneath. And this thing really works as well. Like it's actually detecting everything in real time using accelerometers and capacitive displays. I can extend the display. I can change the display. And it's all dependent, a little bit like Conte, what side is the top piece attached to the bottom piece? And what is the orientation of the top, top piece relative to the bottom piece? And like these peaks are really, so there, there's peaking, as I said. So depending which way I do this rotation, it could give me different kind of system. You know, what is my battery? What is the Wi-Fi strength? Something like this. Um, one thing I really like is you can take the thing off. So if I want to share a photo with someone, I can take the top piece off and hand it to a friend, and they can view it. And depending on how I share it, I can let them either go through the rest of that album, so just share not just one photo, but share the whole album. But maybe it's someone I just want to show one picture, and I've got other pictures in that album that maybe I don't want them to see. If I pull it off, and it's a very subtle difference, but I didn't hold on to the display when I pulled it off, now they can see that one picture, but they can't see anything else. So again, it's this, you know, there's even an expressivity in how I remove that top watch face, whether I put my finger on top or don't put it on top. But the sharing aspect is, is really quite interesting. You don't have many technologies that are actually built for sharing in this way. So usually, and I forgot to say this at the beginning of the talk, but usually I say there's something that you're going to be, as I show you all this work, you're going to be like, but what about, but aren't, and the thing that you're probably saying is, well, how, how can you learn all this, right? Like how can people, what are the cognitive abilities that we can match? And it's the one thing that most of the work that I've shown you at this point has been validated in terms of like motor performance. So people can articulate these different things. And the projects I didn't show graphs for, there are graphs that, that we can talk about that. But the real or the related part are how, can, how fast or how easy it is to learn these new vocabularies and, and how easy it is to, to remember those learnings and things like that. So it's this, this cognitive side, which I am, you know, and, and my students were currently investigating this. And, and this is something that we need to be validated as well. I could do, it's a bit of a cop up I could make the argument, well, you know, it's pretty hard to learn a violin. So, you know, if, if you're an illustrator that's using a tool all day, or then you maybe your incentive is to learn the 26 sides to Conte. But that, I would like to do better than that. But I think I've skated on that long enough, and I think I want to do some validation. Um, and just before I, I wrap up, I wanted to show you one project which is actually about a very, I mean, possibly like minimally expressive device. So it's not always about like more, 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 like how many things can we get into a watch, how many things can we get into a pen. Sometimes a very simple device, sometimes this poor triangle, which I beat up quite a bit at the beginning, is still, there's something to be said about just like, you know, hey, we're having a show, can you play the triangle? And you're like, I, I guess, it's easy, right? I mean, everyone can do this, right? There's something nice about that. And it's certainly important, I mean, it's actually very important in interfaces to have this walk up and use. So I'm just gonna show um, a video of this project. So this is not, this was an art installation, and as of yet is not a science, as the, the science contribution has never been published or even analyzed, to tell you the truth, but it's, there is something there. This is a system that um, ran for six weeks in an art gallery, and the idea was to represent the uh, permanent collection, the 2D permanent collection, which had been scanned in a way that people could view in the gallery in a gallery-like experience. So there's a computer vision system that's tracking where people are, and depending where they move their body, they select different artworks. And the tricky part is that this strip on the bottom, it represents every artwork. There are about 3,000 in the system, and it's just the mean RGB value for each of the artworks. 
that bar is continually shifted and and um, sorted, sometimes by hue, sometimes by saturation, sometimes by luminance. Like every half hour, it changes the sorting. So in fact, there's no way for me to find a particular artwork. It's all about serendipitous discovery, which is intentional, because when you think about when you go to an art gallery, it's not a database where you search, you know, show me all the artworks by whatever. You can do that at home on, on Google, right? When you go to an art gallery, it's about an experience. So we wanted to bring some of that experience uh, to this as well. And the neat thing is that the interaction is so simple it has like an expressiveness as well, but it's just basically where you walk and where you move. And we don't give any instructions. I mean, it is, it is an, it's shown as an art piece, so you know, there is that aspect. And I guess the, the science question, which I have yet to really dive into, is what do people do naturally? What do they think you should do? What, um, what do they do when there's more than one people, when there's a crowd? And I've got tons of data. I got permission to get the security camera, and I logged everything for this six or seven week project. And, it's a paper waiting to be written when I have time, maybe this summer. So, Great, so, but I wanted to show something, a, a very simple system as well that is sort of in contrast to those others. So I don't want to say that, that you know, I'm all about complexity. So I think with that, I I'm ended on good time. I wanted, there's lots of people to thank, um, past students and postdocs and external collaborators that have been involved in one or more of these projects. And there's a guide for the different projects if you have some questions about any of them. And I'll end it there and we'll have, we'll have decent time for questions. So thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dan. That was wonderful. So we've got uh, several minutes for questions. Anyone just put up your hand and ask your question. Right. So, so the question right. is, you know, I, I'll repeat it. Yeah, so the question is, um, have I looked into the input, uh, if these input devices or technologies are useful for people with disabilities and things? And it's, it's a great question, and I, I haven't. Like, I haven't explicitly, but I think there's some obvious, especially when you think of, like, Gunslinger, for example, like the arms down action. I think there's, I mean, it's the classic case which you may have studied in, in HCI or usability that you design for one audience, and you discover there's the story of the flight attendant bag, right? And you just you, you study for one audience and then it ends up being useful for many other people, this electronic curb cut idea. So yeah, I think there's something to that, but I haven't, I haven't focused on that. I was curious about the watch, how those pieces fit together. Is it magnetic or? Yeah, so it's all, so yeah, it's all magnets. So they do, they stick, they have a very satisfying, we position the magnets so that it prefers certain orientations. So when it's off axes, it kind of fights the off axes, like for the peaks, which I think is really important. And yeah, and then it kind of snaps back and it has this, yeah, you, I mean, and, and yes, it's possible to lose the top half, I suppose, like that is the other question. But, you know, at least it has, you know, Wi-Fi and stuff, so maybe you can have a chance of finding it. Again. <laughs> It'll call out underneath your, your sofa cushion, right? So, yeah. If you don't have any other questions, I, I've, I can show you a really crazy teaser for Kai. Do you want to see like a robotic uh, watch? Why would you? Not, why would you not want to see? So yeah. So here's a, a paper um, uh, with this guy at Dartmouth, Jin Dong Zeng, and let's just take a. Let's just. Uh, well, after that teaser, now I'm really. Here we go. So here, so imagine the case. I'm wearing a smartwatch. Just ignore the giant electronic pack, and. I need to check the time. Well, if the watch knows where I am, it can crawl around the band up to show me the time, for instance. Or maybe I'm doing something that's really dirty, like with my hands in flour, but, and I can go out, and the watch can actually peek out underneath the, underneath the, uh, the sleeve. Or just, you know, if I'm really engrossed, it can get my attention by maybe telling me to go to lunch by doing this kind of like, oh yeah, here it's doing a twisting thing to be, tell me there's a call. So there's different kind of degrees of freedom of, of movement of this of this little watch prototype. Here's one. This is one that does. Yeah, here it's <laughs> it's lunchtime with the, uh, with the mouse with the iPad. Or even you know I'm here the they're going to take a shower. They leave their watch and they come back and the watch turns. So they get this like tangible or physical you know oh there's some new notations because the watch is off axis. And this one's really fun. But yeah, so here they're texting and navigating at the same time, which is maybe not to be not to be recommended, but the watch is actually indicating the direction just by the physical movement while I keep the, uh, the display of the text straight up. Another one, you know, sharing photos. 
and flip it over and get very excited about sharing sharing photos of this little little monkey. So it's and it's pretty a little bit. I mean, it is a little bit clunky, but here's some of the the guts of it. So it is you know it's a real prototype. It's just kind of big. In fact, there's different layers that sit on top. But we wanted to prototype in this project. The HCI aspect is really we validate would people actually use this at all? Is there any kind of use in it? Do they find it creepy? Different kind of movements and, and just. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure, some they find some of these a little bit creepy. And then a bit of a technical validation, say like, yeah, you can you can build this, right? Assuming that you know, we're not engineers, but there's enough, you know, you can actually get these kind of movements and do this high fidelity prototype. So that project was was a lot of fun. So that's coming up up to Kai and it's um, yeah, it's about the paper will come out soon. So sort of an extension of that Dobby project. Great. All right, thanks so much. Uh, so before everyone heads out, uh, thank you again for attending the 2016-2017 Tux uh, seminar series. Uh, I would like to remind everyone who's in the room that uh, Tux is an open community with no cost to join. Of course, uh, you were all were here to uh, able to see the talk. For those of you who are joining us from industry, uh, if you would like to add your logo to the set of logos or members of the organization, uh, there's no cost to do that. There's no requirement to sponsor. Just send us an email and we would be very happy to, to share your involvement with the broader community. Now, having said that, we do have several sponsors that make this uh, series possible. The first is our marquee sponsor, Stephen Sanders, who's the sponsor of the Sanders series. I'd like us all to thank him for his contribution, please. <laughs> Uh, the next is Autodesk. Who are the, where are the Autodesk employees in the room? One, two, three, four. Excellent. Thank you, Autodesk, for your sponsorship. <laughs> and our sponsors for space administrative support are the Department of Computer Science here at U of T and the Mars uh, uh, facilities. So thank you to them as well. Uh, Tux will resume in the fall. You will see an invitation to nominate speakers for the Sanders series. Uh, the Sanders series brings in uh, top HCI speakers from all over the world. Anyone you think would be of interest to this community, please respond to that call for nominations. We are interested to hear from you, uh, the members whom you would like to see uh, at the series next year. Thank you very much and we'll see you in the fall.